Statistics and Excel, correlation simple with few data points example. Got data? Let's get stuck into it with statistics and Excel. You're not First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must have product because the fact as everyone knows of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Required to, but if you have access to OneNote, we're in the icon left hand side. OneNote presentation 1725 correlation simple few data points example tab. Also, uploading transcripts to OneNote so that you can go into the view tab, immersive reader tool, change the language if you so choose be able to either read or listen to the transcript in multiple different languages using the timestamp to tie in to the video presentations. OneNote desktop version here, thinking about correlation, having different data sets to see whether there's a mathematical relation or correlation between the different data sets. In other words, are the dots of the different data sets roughly moving together in some way, shape, or form? If there is a mathematical relation or correlation between the two different data sets, the next logical question would be, is there a cause and effect relationship that is causing the correlation or mathematical relation between the two different data sets? And if there is a causal relationship, the next logical question would be, what is the causal factor which is causing the causal relationship, which is causing the correlation or mathematical relation between the different data sets? In prior presentations, we thought about a perfect positive correlation and a perfect negative correlation, things that are useful to think about in theory, but aren't usually exactly what we have in practice because normally we don't have a perfect correlation. We have somewhat of an imperfect correlation or trend that we are observing. So this time we'll look at a data set that has less information in it, but is not perfectly correlated. So our example, we're gonna imagine that X is now gonna be the number of hens. So we're talking about hens and Y is gonna be the number of eggs. Now note that if you're looking at two different data sets, you might have some pre-assumptions, some hypotheses that you are gonna make from the data. So for example, if you're talking about hens and eggs, you might be thinking that the hens are gonna be uh, the, the causal factor that's gonna be producing the eggs but you do have a chicken and eggs problem i mean if you were the farmer you could buy eggs that would produce hens that would then make the eggs but you know you might usually generally think that the farmer is going to buy the hens first which are going to be you know producing the eggs or something like that so that's a question of the cause and effect kind of relationship remember that when we're thinking about the mathematical correlation we don't necessarily know if there's a causal factor or not and what that causal factor is. We're just looking at the relationship with the mathematics. So we're gonna imagine that if we had three hens, we've got uh, the number of eggs 105, five hens, we got the eggs at 185, and six hens, uh, the eggs at 201. This is gonna be eggs per year uh, given the number of hens, and then seven hens. 345. Now the the idea here would generally be well if I had more hens then I would you know produce more eggs you would think so you would think that there would be you know a causal relationship between them if we plotted these out if I just plot these four points noting now that it's an easier thing to plot because we're looking at few uh, data points and we can see kind of just from the type of data that we have that you would think that there would be a causal relationship between the number of hens and the number of eggs. 
So now we're going to say, if we were to plot this then, and if I plot this in Excel, I can just select the X and the Y. The X will automatically plot uh, as a default on uh, the X axis here, which is, which is good for us. We're using a scatter plot. And then we can basically label this thing. So you can see our four points. So with three hens, uh, we have 105 eggs. We had the five hens here with five hens. We had uh, 185 eggs. And then with six hens, we had the 200 eggs. And with the seven hens, we had the 350. Now, as you would expect, we have a positive kind of correlation type of relationship. We can draw a line, a trend line in there. And that is a useful thing to do because if we were trying to think about in the future whether or not we need to buy more hens, if we want to have more eggs, and we're trying to think how many more hens do we need in order to achieve so many more eggs, I can't really look at these, these different dots and try to figure that out. I can kind of like say, okay, I'm going to put a dot up here somewhere. But if I have a line, then of course we can use the formula of a line to give an idea of what the approximate number of hens would be to uh, produce the, the next number of eggs. Now also again, remember that usually we put the hens or we put the independent variable, in this case the hens, on the x generally, and we put the dependent variable on the y. So again, I would imagine as a farmer, you're thinking about how many eggs you're gonna make, that you would go buy hens and then say, how many hens do I need in order to possibly produce enough eggs? However, again, you could think of it as, well, what if they were to buy eggs and then the eggs would make the hens, but some roosters, maybe roosters that you have to eat or something before they start roostering and then you, but you, so you could think about it that way too. But, but so that, so, but there it is. So you, now if I was to flip them, what would happen? What if I put the egg, eggs on the X and the hens on the Y? Would I get a negative correlation? No, you're still going to get a positive correlation mathematically you still have the, the positive correlation uh, shown here. So now you've got the number of eggs. So if I had this number uh, of, of eggs, then you've got three hens, right? If I had, so you can think of it in this fashion. If I had around 100 and whatever that is, eggs, 180, I think it was, then you can predict that you had, you know, five hens uh, or uh, in that fashion as well. So you still have the positive uh, relationship. You can still draw the trend line, whether you put, you switch, you switch out the X's or the Y's. Okay, so now let's do the mathematical uh, kind of relationship. We can say, what's the mean of this? So the mean calculation, like normal, is the average. So if I take the average number of X's, we can actually calculate this in the calculator because we don't have many X's. Three plus five plus six plus seven divided by four is gonna be the 5.25. And on the Y's, 105 plus 185 plus 201 plus 345 divided by four is gonna be the 209. And then we're gonna take the sample and the sample is gonna be the formula in Excel equals the stand, I'm sorry, the standard deviation, not the sample, the standard deviation of the sample, standard dev dot S of these two data sets, we get the 1.71, that's the measure of the spread, and the 99.92. Uh, so once we have that, we can do our calculation, which is going to be, here's our formula for the calculation, which we're going to take each X minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So we'll do this in a step-by-step -step format. So we're going to take each of the X's, here are the X's, and then do the same with the Y, subtract minus the mean over the standard deviation, which is basically the Z-score. Then we'll sum all of them up and divide by N minus one. Let's do that one by one. We're going to say first we have the X's. So let's do it each of the data points minus the X. So we're going to say three, uh, three, five, and seven minus X. So we have, if I was to look at that over here, the three here minus, minus the uh, 5.25, which is the mean. We get to the negative 2.25. And then I take the five minus the 5.25 and I get to the 0.25. I take the six 
minus the 5.25 and I get to the 0.75 and I take the 7 minus the 5.25 and I get to the 1.75. So that's what we have here. There's those three numbers. And then to get to the z-score, we take those numbers and divide them by the standard deviation. So all we're doing now is the next step. We would say, okay, what did we do again? We took the 3 minus the 5.25 divided by the standard D divided by 1.71. And then the next one would be 5 minus the 5.25 divided by the standard D 1.71 and so on and so forth. So we, we have those. Here's the second one, approximately 1. Uh, 0.15 and then we do the same with the y's. Here's all the y's minus the mean of the y. So, so we'd say, okay, the y's over here would be, for example, 105 minus the 209, boom. And then we would take the next one, 185 minus the 209 and so on and so forth. So if I go over here, we're going to say, there we have it, negative 24, negative 8, and then we take each of those and divide it by the standard D. So we just would do then the same thing. If I took this first one, 105 minus the 209, divided by the standard D, 99.92, about 1.04 on the negative. So there we have that. And then we just multiply the Z's together. So these two together. And that will give us then, if I take this first one, 1 1.32 times the 1.04. We get the 1.37 and so on. So if I sum up this last column, I get the numerator. So I can then use my little table here and sum that up. I'm going to put it in a table format. Here's the sum of this column. I can actually do it in a calculator. Why not? Because there's only four numbers. 1.34 plus 0.04 minus 0.04 plus 1.39 gives us about 2.77 rounding is involved then the denominator is just n minus one n is the number of items there's rows one row two row three row four row n minus one is going to give us three and then we have the numerator and denominator in the outer columns 2.77 divided by three is going to give us the uh, 0.92 Notice again the format that I have here of this formula, kind of useful to put it in a table uh, when you're working like in Excel spreadsheets or something like that. It's useful to see it this way. You can build your worksheets this way and say this is the numerator, uh, which is this bit, and then the denominator. I'm going to do a subcalculation, and I'm going to break that out as many subcalculations as I need and pull them into the inner column, indicating it's a subcalculation with the colon, with the indentation, n minus 1. The result then bouncing back out into the outer column, which I can call n minus 1, or simply in this case, the denominator. And then I'm dividing out just the outer columns, 2.77 divided by 3, 0.92. Uh, now I can see this in Excel and use Excel to do this. With the analysis tool, which isn't in Excel by, it's in Excel, but it's not turned on by default. You can find that in the options. We do that in the Excel problem if you want to look at that in more detail. But then in there, I can do the correlation and just pick up this data set. You have to have the data set next to each other. So I just highlight that data set in Excel, and Excel will then give me this prompt. And I'll have to populate. Here's where the data set goes. I'd have to check off the range or that I had the labels involved if I clicked on the labels and then tell me where I want to put it if I was to put it in Excel. And it'll give me something like this. And I'm focused in on the X and the Y, which are intersecting here. There's the 0.9219 and so on that we got to here, although we rounded it. So this isn't dynamic however so if i change the data set this isn't going to change with it so it's not a great tool for your worksheet if you're making a dynamic worksheet but it's a great tool to analyze the data up front or to check your data kind of as we are uh, doing here you can also use the this same data analysis tool and look at this descriptive data and i just want to point that out even though it's not our main point of focus here to give you this 
kind of descriptive information for the X and the Y. This is our general kind of statistics info. You've got the mean, you've got the standard error, the median, the mode, the standard deviation, the sample variance, uh, the minimum, the maximum, the sum, the count, and so on. Uh, and this, uh, again, is not dynamic. It doesn't change uh, as your data changes. So I, it's a good tool to use as a preliminary analysis. It might be the first thing you do before you build something out of your data set to get a feeling or an idea of what's going on with them. And you can highlight multiple data sets and have it spit out, or you can use it as a check figure for your data sets. So just a quick recap here. We're now looked at a, at a perfect positive correlation, a perfect negative correlation. Now we're looking at more of a realistic example where it's not perfectly correlated, but you have a general trend. This one being one where in advance you would expect to see some kind of general trend. And by plotting out that trend, you can get more understanding about the data sets and possibly giving you predictive power into the future, such as how many hens would I would I need to buy by you know using the mathematical formula? Obviously, that you know these hens were doing were doing great, and then these purchases of hens were kind of slacker hens, and they weren't up to you know the production line that that we were expecting from them. Uh, but again, laying eggs is I'm not laying eggs is difficult. I would I would assume, so I'm not complaining. I'm not like you know it's tough work. But you would think like the other hens were doing. You know did a little bit better some you know than these hints but then this one is outside but then you have the trend line and the trend line can help you to predict uh to predict of course and and then of course we can see what the exact correlation is uh with our calculation here mathematically which will give you an understanding of, of how good that relationship is how reliable you can kind of be on using that you know basically the trend line possibly to make predictions you can do that with a formula calculation which is useful sometimes because as we'll see in future examples breaking this information out like this looking at the z scores will often give you uh, more information or could quite likely give you more information than simply using excel to spit out uh, the uh, z the uh, correlation so but either method would be good and then of course graphing it when you graph it out you get that pictorial representation so we can look at the correlation conceptually we can might have an idea about what the correlation might be and then of course we can plot out it on a graph and see it pictorially and pick up the formula of the trend line which could be useful and then we can do a mathematical calculation of the correlation in this case having of course a uh, positive correlation, but not perfectly positive.